Good afternoon. Hello, and welcome to another Careers with STEM webinar. Today, we're going to reveal insights, information, and advice on STEM careers in space. If you're joining us live, please get your questions ready. We have a stellar lineup of impressive space professionals who are standing by to share their career paths and answer your questions. You might also be watching this via the Careers with STEM YouTube channel, so thank you for tuning in. I'm speaking to you here from Refraction Media Studios in Gadigal country, and I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and I acknowledge our First Nations people as the original STEM innovators and traditional owners of Australia, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Welcome to this special edition of Careers with STEM Space. We're here today to learn more about Australia's growing space industry. We'll meet some space scientists, technicians and experts, and we'll bust some myths and challenge some stereotypes while answering your questions about space careers. This webinar is made up of three parts. Part one is a Careers with STEM explainer, where I'll tell you a bit more about the Careers with STEM platform and where you can find information and resources on the hundreds of STEM careers and people we profile every day. Part two is an overview of the Australian space sector, including areas set to boom, careers, employers, and starting salaries. And in part three, we'll meet our space professionals who work with satellites and software, policy and communications, neutrons and moons, and we've got a former NASA astronaut trainer who's now teaching the next generation of space superstars. So let's get started. Please feel free to use the Q&A function for this webinar at the bottom of the screen, and I'll share your questions with the panel when we get to them. But first though, it's time to meet your presenter. My name is Karen Taylor-Brown and I'm the co-founder of Careers with STEM and Refraction Media, which is a STEM specialist media company. Here's a picture of me and my business partner, Heather, when we went to Google in Mountain View, California two years ago, which was awesome. I have a background in media, mostly magazines, where I've worked with some of the world's biggest titles like Cosmopolitan, as well as well-known Australian science magazine, Cosmos. But don't get those two confused because they're very different. I studied biology as part of my arts degree at Sydney. So when people ask me what's my STEM plus X, I tell them it's biology plus media. In 2014, my business partner and I founded the Careers with STEM Hub, which includes a quarterly magazine, job kits, posters, videos, events, webinars, quizzes, and a website to help young people discover the careers of the future. We deliver magazines to every Australian secondary school for free across each of the STEM disciplines. Plus special editions like space, resources, cybersecurity, and the just released indigenous issue. At Careers with STEM, we believe that everyone should have equal access to build a better future. Many of tomorrow's careers will combine STEM skills with other areas. We call it STEM plus X like technology plus fashion, which equals 3D printed clothes, maths plus sport equaling footy statisticians. STEM jobs are growing at almost two times faster than other jobs, yet enrollments in STEM degrees and courses are growing much more slowly or even declining. We'd like to change that. We manage the Careers with STEM website where you can find updated news, videos, and do career quizzes. When you can search by your favorite STEM foundation, science, technology, engineering, or maths, plus your X or your passion like health, business, environment, or space. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel where this webinar will be available, as well as a bunch of other careers with STEM webinars like maths and data, engineering, data science, and future science. And you'll also find the new job kits on our website where we unpack exciting jobs like software engineer or machine learning engineer, data scientist, robotics and automation engineer, and many more. Just download them, print them out, or look at them online. But now let's shift our focus to space and space careers, where we'll discover some big opportunities and find out about some surprisingly accessible jobs and see who's hiring. 
You might have seen that last week, Careers with STEM launched the very first Space Special Edition. And today we're going to unpack this issue and learn more about the growing space industry. Meet some space scientists, technicians and experts and bust some myths and answer your questions about space careers. Did you know that jobs in the space sector are incredibly varied? Some people work in space law or space medicine, while others have expertise in manufacturing or coding, research or communication. When it comes to space careers, not even the sky's the limit. Today, we're going to discuss future space careers, the opportunities for employment in the space sector, courses that will help you get there and who your future employer might be. You'll also meet four real life Australian space professionals who are standing by right now, including Helen Maynard Caisley, who's a planetary scientist at ANSTO, and Gail Isles, who's a senior lecturer at RMIT and former astronaut instructor. But first, next, let's explore the space careers scene. A job in the space sector may seem out of reach or only available to a select few who want to be an astronaut. But the good news is there are lots of space jobs that draw on STEM skills in areas like software development, industrial design, metal fabricating. Space jobs are a part of our everyday lives and make life easier here on Earth. The Australian Space Agency aims to triple the size of the Australian space sector and create 20,000 more space jobs in Australia in the next 10 years but we're gonna need more people. The next generation of the space workforce to make it happen. So if you have an interest or a curiosity about space, there could be a job for you out there in the near future. A lot has happened in the area of space since man first walked on the moon. And it's more about innovation than aliens. Star Wars was one of the biggest blockbuster enterprises of all time and led the way in space innovation. Think hologram messages, messages building whole planets and intergalactic travel, and you've covered space and innovation in one movie series. In real life, it's the people at places like NASA, the Australian Space Agency, and Defence Science and Technology who are making the magic happen. Whether it's being part of a team working on the new spacesuit technology to help astronauts float safely for longer, or launching satellites into space to monitor cyber signals and the dark web, or observing Earth for environmental and ocean movements, there are plenty of jobs in the space realm. Here are just five jobs you could land in space. Number one, satellite engineer. Satellites are a huge part of humanity's technological progression and are used in everything from communications to GPS and scientific research. As a satellite engineer, you design and manufacture satellites and even help write software to remotely control them from Earth. You, you might learn how to build nano and micro satellites. Employers include companies like Optus and Lockheed Martin who hire satellite engineers. Number two, space weather analysts. As a space weather analyst, you'll monitor sunspots and solar flares to provide early warning of impacts to power grids and satellite operators, as well as emergency response to communications on earth. You might find yourself working at the Bureau of Meteorology Number three, payload scientist. Payload means all the extra stuff loaded on a vehicle. In this case, a spacecraft. It could be an experiment for a science, it could be equipment for a science experiment. A payload scientist or specialist is a member of a team chosen for their specific expertise in operating or working with a particular payload. For example, they might be the one conducting the experiment that is the whole point of the mission or operating some vital equipment on the spacecraft. Big public research organisations like the CSIRO and DST are always on the lookout for scientists to help build pay payloads. Number four, propulsion technician. Propulsion technicians or engineers are the brains behind propulsion systems. Think rocket and jet engines. You'd be responsible for designing and manufacturing these machines to be safer, faster and more efficient or more powerful. You could land a job somewhere like Black Sky Aerospace or Equatorial Launch Australia. And number five, flight or mission controller. NASA calls this job the people behind the astronauts. They play a crucial role in every space mission, monitoring and controlling all aspects of space in real time from launch to landing. 
To qualify, you'll need to study subjects like computer programming and signal and systems engineering. Employers include Cyber Astronautics, which is the company building the Australian Mission Control in Adelaide. A large and growing part of Australia's space sector includes defending the vital space-enabled technology that we rely on every day for everything from GPS to communications and surveillance. With more than 2,600 satellites orbiting the Earth, and that number growing every year, the risk of tensions and conflict is ever-present and increasingly complex. In response, in July 2020, the Australian Department of Defence announced it was investing $7 billion in space capability over the next decade to counter emerging space threats. That means big career opportunities for STEM grads with the skills and the passion to keep our vital infrastructure secure. But there are also plenty of Earth-based space jobs, like in agriculture. Forget the tractor driving stereotype, these days, farmers are flying drones and donning wearable technology. But the coolest thing about modern farming is the fact that agriculture roles are no longer reserved for physical farms or even earth in general. Space companies are crying out for STEM graduates with advanced knowledge of farming processes and systems to manage crops and water supplies using sophisticated space systems. And the awesome news for high school students it's a perfect time to think about kickstarting a study path into the space industry, with Australia both recently establishing a dedicated space agency and committing to growing these industries. Let's have a look at four surprising uses of space technology in agriculture. Number one, harvesting space data. Collecting information on the state of soil in a particular area, pollution levels and water temperatures, all from accurate satellite setups, is revolutionizing the accuracy of the land care game. Number two, tracking and tagging cattle. Farmers have been tagging and tracking cattle for years, but thanks to new reliance on space technology, their systems have come a long way from manual monitoring. In one of the coolest research projects to come out of 2020, large herds of wild water buffalo in the Northern Territory are being tracked and managed by next-gen space technology to generate data that rangers can use to reduce the impacts of the cattle on the environment. Number three, driverless tractors. In the US, self-driving tractors cultivate the majority of farmlands, with many of them relying on software straight out of NASA. In fact, the highly accurate GPS signal errors and increased location smarts makes this tech one of the space agency's most game-changing contributions to life on Earth. And number four, satellites for mapping. Experts at Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, have developed a new product called ePaddix. And this technology is going to set the standard for future geospatial digital agriculture products to improve land use, maps and to track species. So if you're interested in getting a start in space, here are just a, some of the courses that you could look into. A bachelor, bachelor of Space Science at RMIT in Victoria. A Bachelor of Science Advanced Astrophysics at QUT in Queensland. Bachelor of Technology Aviation at Edith Cowan University in WA. Bachelor of Engineering with Space Engineering at the University of Sydney a Master's of Space Engineering at UNSW Canberra, or a Bachelor of Technologies, Defence Industries at the University of Adelaide. But now let's get into the fun part of the webinar where we meet some of the people that are driving our space industry forward. Let's first of all meet our panel and then I'll call upon them one by one to tell us a little bit about what they're working on. First in line is Thomas Ireland, who is a software engineer at Gilmore Space Technologies, and he's also the Careers with STEM Space cover star. Secondly, we have Annie Daly, who's the Executive Director of Operations and Communications at the Australian Space Agency. Helen Maynard Casely is a planetary scientist at ANSTO, and Dr. Gail Isles is a senior lecturer at RMIT and a former astronaut instructor. So the first person we're going to bring on board is Thomas. Thomas is a highly ambitious individual who was previously self-employed. He decided to complete his honours in electrical and electronic engineering at Griffith University, Queensland, to pursue a career with more meaning and purpose. Thomas currently works as a software engineer for Gilmore Space Technologies, a fast-growing rocket company located in the beautiful Gold Coast. 
He's currently working with the team to design and build the Eris Orbital Rocket, which is set to launch satellites into low Earth or orbits from 2022. So Thomas, if you're there, I just ask you to unmute and turn your video on. I'll stop sharing my screen so that we can have a chat. Hi, Thomas, thanks for joining us. It's all right, thanks for having me on board, appreciate it. No worries. Thomas, I'm curious, what is this Eris Orbital Rocket? Can you tell us a bit about that and Gilmore Space Technologies? Yeah, so first of all, um, Gilmore Space, we're a startup rocket company on the Gold Coast in Queensland. Um, we have a rapidly growing team of about 60 people now, and some of us have come from all around the world, um, previously worked for big companies like Rocket Lab, uh, Boeing, the European Space Agency. Um, so I get to work with some incredibly switched on people. It's brilliant. Um, and the goal is, our current goal is to launch small satellites into orbit starting from 2022. Um, and to do that, we're currently designing and manufacturing our first rocket named Eris. Fantastic. And what will these satellites do when they're orbiting our Earth? Um, there's a variety of different things, endless really. Um, communications, tracking, um, yeah, it's literally endless what we can do with satellites in space. Great. So how did you get this amazing job? Yeah, so I think you mentioned, so after high school, I started studying a Bachelor of Engineering, uh, majoring in Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Griffith. Uh, but during then, I started a few small businesses and they were doing pretty well. So I decided to defer to focus on them full time. Um, I was making pretty good money as a kid, but I was lacking motivation and meaning and purpose. Didn't really have a reason to wake up every morning because the money, it was just money at the end of the day. Um, I decided to go back to uni to finish studying what I was really passionate about, which was technology and using that to design and build things to make the world a better place. Um, so I was in my final year of uni and needed to complete. Um, a certain amount of placement days at an engineering company to finish my degree. So I'd heard of Gilmore Space, a company in the Gold Coast building a rocket, and I emailed in hoping to land an internship. Um, luckily, Gilmore had a great relationship with Griffith and their work integrated learning program and I was offered a placement. And it turns out they liked me enough to keep me on board afterwards. So oh. here we are today. Well, congratulations, sounds amazing. Thank you. So can you tell us or can you describe to us what a typical day in your job looks like? Sure. So as a software engineer, um, I work with the avionics team and also the guidance navigation control team. So we're responsible for programming the brains of the rocket, essentially. Uh, we make sure that all the parts of the rocket can talk to each other. We find out where the rocket is during its flight, where it needs to go to get our payload into the correct orbit and determine how to stay on the correct trajectory. So we tell the motors when to fire, when to separate each stage and when to deploy our payload as well. Um, we work with other teams such as the mechanical team who are responsible for building the body and structure of the rocket and propulsion team who develop rocket engines. So a typical day involves me getting into work and of course, first thing, charging my brain with a coffee. Uh, I'm useless without my coffee in the morning and we like to plan our work into week long chunks. So I'll review what the weekly goal is and determine what I want to achieve for the day. Um, and as a software engineer, I do spend a lot of time in front of the computer, who would have guessed. Um, but we have to validate a lot of the stuff we write with hardware as well to test it all. So I do spend a lot of time tinkering with hardware. Um, because we're developing a lot of new different things, we spend a lot of time brainstorming with other teams and other people how best to solve things. And something very interesting, which I didn't find from uni, um, when you're at an engineering company, you have to develop um, with a certain outcome in mind. So you have to achieve an outcome with a certain budget in a certain time frame, with a certain regard to performance and regard to safety. So it's not just the technically um, the technical best outcome at an engineering company. Um, and by doing that, we have a lot of chances to flex our problem solving skills. And if I want a break from the computer, there's always someone that could use a hand. Um, so the day is really never boring. It certainly doesn't sound boring. Tell me, when you were at school, did you always want to work in space or working your career has it been a surprise to you? Honestly, a huge surprise. I never, ever thought I'd be working in the space industry in Australia. I thought, I'd always thought it was um, awesome, obviously, but I um, always thought I'd have to move overseas to be able to be involved. So I feel incredibly blessed. Um, and for everyone aspiring to be in the space industry in Australia, now is a better time than ever. 
So we're lucky enough to meet the new head of the Australian Space Agency, Enrico Palermo, um, this week. And he confirmed there's going to be a massive, massive push for the space industry in Australia. And I think Annie will most likely touch more on this, uh, which is on a bit later. Yeah, I can't wait to hear more about it. It's definitely an exciting time for space. Tell me, tell me when you were at school, what was your favourite subject and what were you good at? Um, so my favourite subjects were the maths and sciences. I went to school on the Gold Coast here at Somerset College. Um, so I found as a kid, you learn that the world around you exists and behaves in certain ways, but you don't really understand why. And the more I learned about the sciences at school, I understood there were laws and systems that governed everything around us. Um, and I learned that we can use these laws to create some amazing things to help people and make people's lives better, which was super exciting for me. Um, so that's why I chose to study engineering at uni. Definitely sounds like it has the purpose like you mentioned. Um, yeah. If you were to talk to somebody who's at school right now and thinking about a career in space, would you have any advice for them? Yes, yeah, so look, as you mentioned, there are plenty of different fields um, in which you can get a future career in space. You don't have to be an astronaut or an engineer or anything. Um, and I can't wait to hear from Annie, Helen and Gail to share their stories with us as well, because their fields are all quite different. Um, I honestly suggest you need to try as many different things as you can and, and find out exactly what it is you're interested in. So think about your favourite subjects at school, what you like to do outside of school and how that might relate to your future career. Um, because whatever you're passionate in will drive you to develop skills in that area. And ultimately, that's what you want. Um, so I completed a degree in electrical and electronic engineering, but turns out I like writing software a lot more. Um, so yeah, find out what it is you're passionate in, you can start to develop those skills. Um, in our company, we have many non-engineering roles. We need our manufacturing team to actually build the rocket, um, finance team to handle our money, human resources, legal team, sales, marketing, communications. Um, and we also have many people who started off in different fields. So we have a physicist and a former medical science researcher now in an engineering role. Um, also a former tradesman that went back to uni to get their degree and are now engineers. Um, and I think if you don't know exactly what you want to do right now, it's completely okay. Um, it's okay to not have it all figured out straight away after school. Good advice. Thanks for that, Tommy. If anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask Thomas, feel free to put them in the Q&A. And I've got one that's already here, Thomas, that I might throw at you. Uh, it's sure. quite specific. It says, what tech stack, um, what's the tech stack required for your job that comes from Steph? Tech stack. Um, it really differs. So my role, I was hired to do more embedded software, um, some more low level like C, C++. Um, but really, even in the software realm, um, there's so many different aspects. There's the actual embedded rocket software which is real-time safety critical. There's also a lot of things like the ground control stations, um, DevOps, so helping the other teams with the IT and programming, all that type of thing. So it really, really differs. There's no one kind of specific skill set um, for my role. That makes sense. All right, well, yeah. thanks for the questions, Steph. And yeah, if anyone else has any, any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we're going to get Thomas to come back toward the end with the panellists so we can go through more questions there. Thanks, Thomas. We'll speak no to worries. you in a little while. Thank you. No worries. All right. So let me just quickly share my screen again. So we've got, Thomas mentioned that um, Annie is going to be speaking with us. I'm so pleased that we've got Annie with us today. Annie is the Executive Director of Operations and Communications at the Australian Space Agency. She's responsible for all operations of the agency, for establishing its program, risk and accountability requirements, and ensuring it meets government, um, meets government requirements. In addition to managing the parliamentary interaction, finances, human resources, media and communications, Annie is also responsible for establishing a pathway to inspiring a nation to support the space industry. As a chartered professional engineer, Annie graduated from the University of Technology, Sydney, and took on a career in sustainability, Working across multiple government agencies, as well as not-for-profits and consultancies, Annie brings more than 12 years of experience as a senior executive to the agency. So I'd just like to invite Annie to join us, unmute and get your video going and say thank you so much for coming to talk to us and explaining a little bit more about the, the, the exciting movement of space in Australia. 
It's my absolute pleasure, Karen, and it's wonderful to, to actually be here today and to, to be able to share a little bit about the Australian Space Agency and what we're doing. Um, and then I will go through a little bit and provide a bit of uh, outline about myself and many of our other colleagues, just like Tommy indicated earlier, we've all got diverse backgrounds and it just shows that you can have a variety of interests and be part of the space industry. So I'm Annie, I'm actually sitting here in the headquarters of the Australian Space Agency um, and it's wonderful to, to meet on the lands of our local Indigenous people and to be able to, to, to participate here today. I, um, I want to just show you a very quick video and apologies if it's a little bit um, uh, blurry but the, the understanding is just listen to the storyline because the most important part of this is that many people don't realize that space actually improves our day-to-day -day lives. It is part of making the world a better place. And if you are part of, of wanting to do that and to, to care about the environment, to care about people, then you can still have a career in space. So this is just a short video that you can also see on our YouTube channel. Since taking that one giant leap, people have benefited from space. Many of the things we take for granted work because of space technology. From GPS location tracking and navigation. To forecasting climate and weather events. To improving how we connect and share information. Space tech has made our lives easier and safer. So now that we know what space technology does for us today, what will it do for us tomorrow? gives you a little bit of an understanding that space actually helps us, whether it's in bushfires, weather, um, looking after and using GPS as, as a means to, to find people and engage with people. Uh, the, the whole idea is that the space industry can be part of whatever career pathway you're interested in. But a little bit about the agency, because a lot of people know about NASA, they know about the, the European Space Agency. And that here at the Australian Space Agency, we're very much guided by, by being a globally respected uh, industry. Uh, we're very much focused about jobs and career pathways. So we're very interested in growing the economy. And by growing the economy, it means that there's just bigger companies, more companies, more jobs available. But everything we're doing here is about improving our lives and, and inspiring a nation. And we do this with an incredible amount of engagement, both nationally and internationally. I do want to tell you about one flagship project that's going to happen in the next three to five years, and that is our Moon to Mars program, where we're going to be demonstrating capabilities that Australians have, and then, you know, putting, putting Australian businesses into supply chains of international organisations. And what this means is that we will have a project, and hopefully you will, you will see in the next five years maybe an Australian um, uh, flag on a piece of awesome creativity and innovation that actually maybe lands on the moon. And this is really exciting for the industry as well, because it means that lots of companies can be involved in, in doing something that the nation can be incredibly proud about. Uh, early on, Karen did outline the, the huge variety of careers that you can have in space. And I just want to highlight a little bit more about that because it really is, and when you see about the career pathways of some of us that work in the Australian Space Agency, it is very, very diverse. Uh, I am an engineer, um, but I tend to use it a lot more in a business and, and in, a, um, in a communications manner. Uh, scientists, we absolutely need scientists across different um, career pathways. Commerce, the business side of space is, is actually growing dramatically. Venture capital firms um, are very interested in it. 
and as well we're also very interested in the regulation uh, industry and, and many space lawyers that can actually enable uh, you know the drafting of things to make sure that this is safe and, and really exciting going forward uh, but puts us instead to to meet our international obligations and of course communications and the most exciting area in Australia right now is in the medical field uh, with health management from a distance uh, it's very interesting Australia is actually a world leader in, in, in medical technologies and we've got somebody uh, in the agency who, who is part of that and it's just very exciting. Um, I wanted to highlight um, a few younger people that are working in the industry more broadly. Uh, these, these are young people that have, uh, have taken on, um, just like Tommy, doing internships or um, entry-level roles. And the, the cool thing about it is every single person says, you know, you tend to think of engineers being quiet in quiet rooms, you know, away from people. But the reality is that there's some really exciting jobs out there. And there's, this is an industry that really attracts passionate and inspired individuals who want to make a change. Uh, it's never boring, as uh, Diani says, it, it is changing every single day. I want to highlight uh, a number of agency staff members. So Ord is our chief technology officer and very much has what I call a traditional space engineering, space technology background. But she worked before the agency because the agency is only two years old. She worked in uh, advanced communications. Uh, think about it. If, uh, if one of the grand finals of the AFL was not broadcast or uh, the only people that would actually know about the, the match would be uh, those that go in person. And now, you know, just in a COVID environment, we've relied heavily on streaming of, um, of, of games and, and activities like that around the world. The reason that we know what's happening in, uh, in the UK within minutes is not just by um, the live beat, but the fact is that, you know, TV camera people can actually broadcast that and they all use uh, space technologies to do that. Michael is in our regulation area. He spent a lot of time engaging with the United Nations. And I know lots of people are quite passionate about, about being part of that type of international fora. And his job is very much to make sure that, that we uh, lead as a responsible country and provide advice, advice assurance, and, and, and set rules and laws um, that govern the international community. And he's very much a, an active member of that. Sian has got such a wonderful... Um, exciting career pathway. She's very passionate about STEM and supporting younger individuals and people from diverse backgrounds to really engage with this industry. Um, and I just wanted to point out that, you know, I've got two Adams on the screen and Adam Seedsman comes from a very defense background. It doesn't have the, the what you would call the expected uh, engineering background. He comes from a design, uh, but he worked on a lot of defense projects and now is actually responsible for all the policy and strategy work here at the agency. Uh, Catherine uh, did go overseas uh, to pursue her studies in a bit more detail and did a lot of internships across um, international organisations, but has brought that all back here to Australia um, to, to lead uh, some of our chief technology activities. And Adam now is actually, he was in our engagement lead but he's now actually doing a lot of risk uh, around launch activity for the Australian Space Agency. So very quickly, you can see that uh, their backgrounds are all very, very different. Uh, my background is that I've always been a passionate uh, space enthusiast, even at high school. Um, and this is my big advice to, to, to students that are still at university, is to participate in all the, uh, the options that come through to you. There are space camps. There are space um, shows, there are talks, there are things for you to be involved in. I got involved at high school with the National Space Society of Australia. Um, I went to all the talks at the Powerhouse Museum. I was based in Sydney at the time. And I got heavily involved with young, other young people who are passionate about space. And now it's wonderful that many of them now are starting their own space companies. So it's an extremely, um, it's been a pathway of love and passion for me since I was probably in, in by year seven, year eight at, at school. I started going to space camps in year 10 and they were just absolutely phenomenally amazing. So I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, but I took my engineering in, a, in an environmental space because I really wanted to, to look after the planet. I was very concerned about climate change and sustainability. And without a, a space agency and without much of a space industry, 
I wanted to stay in Australia. So I did a lot of work in the government space to support um, environmental outcomes. And then I got the exciting opportunities to work on you know, disaster um, and infrastructure management, moved into um, very much a policy and a government policy and, and understanding uh, politics is really, really important for, for being able to predict what's gonna happen in the future. So I worked at the uh, Prime Minister's um, Department and then I um, had, had the wonderful opportunity to work in the Bureau of Meteorology, working exactly with space weather um, individuals. And it was just an eye-opening experience. And now I uh, had the fortunate pleasure to be able to be part of the leadership team for the Australian Space Agency. So no matter what, an exciting a future awaits in the space industry. And I would highly, highly encourage anybody that wants to, to be a part of improving lives of others to be part of innovation um, and you don't need to be the, the, the maths whiz. Uh, I was not the maths whiz, I, um, I obviously did maths, uh, but I, I found that just being a curious mind will give you those, those opportunities. So thanks very much, Karen. That's wonderful, thank you so much, Annie. It's so exciting to hear your career journey yourself that it started from such a young age and to see how you've carved out such an interesting career and the fact that we now have our own space agency just means the opportunities are limitless for not only the young people of Australia but anybody so thanks for sharing that with me with us and I really encourage everybody to jump on board the Australian Space Agency's channels and keep up to date with what's happening because there's a lot going on at the moment. Yes, thank you. No problem. Next cab off the rank is Dr. Helen Maynard Casely, who is an instrument scientist uh, at the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering at ANSTO, which is where she works with a piece of equipment called Wombat, which sounds cute, but is actually a high intensity neutron diffractometer. And I'll get her to explain that a little bit further shortly. Most of Helen's job involves helping other scientists from biologists and chemists to engineers to help them use Wombat to experiment. But she also uses Wombat for her own research, research, which is all about icy planets and moons. So Helen, I just ask if you can unmute and start your video so we can hear a little bit more about what you're working on. So, hi Helen, how are you? I'm good. Hello, everybody. Um, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the um, Darawal people and uh, acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, um, just because this is where I'm working from. And the Ansto site is just to the south of Sydney. Great. Thanks, Helen. And thank you so much for joining us. Now, Wombat sounds cute, but I bet there's more to it than what we might think. Can you tell us a little bit about it and what you do with it? Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, Wombat is one of 15 instruments that um, that sort of uh, radiate out of Australia's only nuclear reactor, which is just, as I say, to the south of Sydney. Um, we took the approach quite early on to name all our instruments after animals, and uh, there's usually a little bit of a theme. Um, so Wombat is our high intensity instrument, and um, well, you, as, as probably many people know, you don't get between the wombat and its food and you don't get between our wombat and its um, samples. So wombat is all about finding um, where atoms are in materials. So anything that's sort of crystalline or semi-crystalline, we can put in wombat and we can literally tell you exactly where all the atoms are. We can also do something to the sample. So one of the things is because it's a high intensity instrument, we can construct really big what we call sample environment around it. So this is something that makes the sample either really, really cold, very high magnetic fields, very high pressure, and we can see what's happening to the structure and sort of design the materials around that. So this is obviously, um, you can see, very useful for a, a great range of scientists. Right at the moment, I'm working with a chemist who's who's looking at a, um, a framework material um, that's hopefully going to um, sort of sop up hydrogen and carbon dioxide dioxide. Um, she's also thinking of looking at um, these same materials for storing oxygen in a safe way, which of course is very useful for space as well. So that's one thing I'm doing right now. But um, I also use the instruments to sort of recreate the surfaces, um, the conditions on surfaces of other planets. Great. So um, 
why is it important for us to understand the surfaces of other, other planets and moons when we're here on Earth? Um, oh, it's absolutely crucial in, in, in a number of ways. I mean, one, it's utterly um, like to be human is to explore, is to be curious. And one of the wonderful things about where we live uh, in terms of a solar system is that our solar system is really diverse. We've got everything from, from Mercury, which is this little sort of uh, magnetic planet, um, all the way through to the icy moons. And they all have interesting surfaces. And we really, you know, we've seen sort of volcanoes, we've seen different craters, we see things that are like Earth, but then are a bit different. Different. And um, that certainly helps us sort of explain a bit more about what's going on. There's sort of other questions. I mean, um, the field I work in, as I say, planetary science is essentially the sort of story of us, how our planet came to be and how it came to be as it is now. And, and most of those questions come from planetary science. But then looking to the future, like Earth is not going to be able to um, produce all the resources that we need um, going forwards. And, and more and more, we're going to look a bit further out in our solar system for future resources so especially things like um, rare earth elements so these are things that are very crucial to your mobile phones and uh, and renewable technology um, small small uh, there's only very small amounts of these elements on earth and they're quite hard to extract we've got a whole um, sort of suite of thing uh, of rocky bodies um, asteroids out in the solar system and it's look we're looking more and more to those um, as um, as future resources what's the most surprising thing you've discovered using your instruments so um, the way that I go about my science and the reason I've chosen my background is quite uh, crucial. Um, so I take the information that comes from um, and many of the this planetary space missions that go off to space. So this image behind me, um, I'm going to point out here because this is taken from the near infrared mapping spectrometer, which flew on the Galileo space program. And this was a space probe that explored um, Jupiter and its icy moons. It's the reason we know anything about the fascinating worlds of Europa and Ganymede and Callisto and even Io as well and of course Europa is really exciting to a lot of scientists because we know now because of Galileo that it has an ocean over the um, ocean underneath an iced crust so there's potentially that's a nice little place to, to live so it's a it's a potential place that we could have biology um, aside from our own earth but this is a, an image from the spectrometer and if i just point here you can see what it did at fifty thousand kilometers as it was uh, whizzing off to jupiter turned around and took a picture of a place we know quite well this is this is um, australia and the really fun the amazing thing i love about this is it sort of gives you an idea of the chemical composition but it also can pick up there's the um the Great Barrier Reef just to the side of me um, up here. Um, so from 50,000 kilometers, this um, spacecraft could tell you that the, um, the the Great Barrier Reef was there. Obviously, it's the largest living object on Earth, so you kind of hope it's here. But it's got a slightly different chemical signature to a lot of the things around it because it's, it's um, made out of coral, which is calcium carbonate. So this same instrument flew within 120 kilometers of the surface of Europa. And so as a result, could pick up lots and lots of different things about the chemistry on the surface. Now, we know, now we know a lot about the chemistry. We know a lot about the materials there for places like Europa and Titan, because the Cassini mission found out a lot about Titan. But the conditions there are a bit different. They tend to be very, very cold. And these things all mix up together in a way that we don't really see on Earth in the sort of natural sense that the minerals on Earth are all a little bit different. And so what uh, a lot of my work at the moment is mixing the chemicals that we know informed by these spacecraft and seeing what the materials are, seeing how the atoms are arranged. And then we know something about how strong they are and how they can shape the surfaces. So this sort of all started and probably the most surprising result is the fact that I keep finding new materials. Um, since I've been in Australia, I've discovered eight new materials. Um, and just from very simple chemistry. So I should say that a lot of what um, the Galileo spacecraft and the Cassini spacecraft told us about the icy moons are that their surfaces are made out of very simple materials, but they mix in a way that we don't see on Earth. And then we tend to get these new materials, which again, 
many of my friends who are chemists who spend years in the lab so sort of mixing up very complicated things get a bit annoyed with me because they're like Helen you literally took some salt and water and you made a new material I'm like what can I say so <laughs> um so that's that's a really um surprising discovery that despite these are really simple chemicals we keep on getting more and more interesting materials so there's more much more still to find that's fantastic. And there's no doubting your enthusiasm for your work and, and what's to come as well. Helen, what advice would you give to a high school student who has the same passion and interest about the planets around us? Well, I think both um, Tommy and Annie's advice before was really great, um, especially with Tommy saying sort of get involved and try lots of different things because you're not going to know what necessarily um, you do you want and what you're interested in until you try it until you try starting um, to study it and um, personally I often think back to um, me a number of years ago and I used to be utterly terrified that I was going to by choosing a particular path or by choosing a thing that I was going to be like putting the shutters down and not being able to do something in future what I've realized is that there is no wrong path and that if you follow what you're interested in you literally can't go wrong you just keep following that and yes it may be stopping you do you may not be building up the things to do something else but um, you're moving along a path to do something that you're interested in you're passionate so essentially my big my big headline advice is um, don't panic there is nothing wrong you can do if you follow your interests. I love that. Don't panic and there's no wrong path. I think that's going to put everybody at ease and me, me included. Thank you so much, Helen. And if you could stick around, that'd be fantastic. If anyone in the audience wants to ask any questions to Helen or Annie or Thomas, put them in the Q&A and we'll get to those at the end. But our next space professional I want to invite to join us is Dr. Gail Isle. Gail is a senior lecturer in space and physics at RMIT University, launching the first dedicated industry-focused space science degree in Australia in 2020. Drawing on extensive experience flying on the Vomit Comet, conducting experiments in zero G, RMIT students learn about space from a trusted source. In 2008, Gail applied to become an astronaut with the European Space Agency. And although she was not selected, in 2010, she became an astronaut instructor instead, teaching those who were selected how to operate equipment on board the International Space Station. So Gail, if you could unmute and join us, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Gail. Great to see you. Hi, Karen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to everyone here today. Oh, you're very welcome. And that's an interesting background you've got there. Is there is that is that does that describe the type of work environment you used to work in as an astronaut trainer? Actually, that that was prior to being the trainer. This is the typical view inside the aircraft. So this is an A300 Airbus, and you can see there's all the seats have been taken out and experiments have been put in their place and this was our this was my office this was this was my coolest office for sure that is quite an office and i have to ask you about the vomit comet what is that so there's a myth that you have to go into space to experience zero g that's not the case zero g is merely a, the condition of free fall so if you fly an aeroplane and you make a parabolic arc in the sky, you won't get this on a commercial aircraft, that would frighten everyone. But if you take a special plane like the A300 behind me and fly this kind of maneuver called a parabola, you can get zero G as you go over the top of that curve. And that generates a short period of zero G or microgravity. And although it might only be 20 seconds, it's still long enough to conduct a quick scientific measurement. So if you've got your equipment all set up and ready to go, then you can do your measurement in those 20 seconds. And it's called the Vomit Comet because approximately 25% of the people on board will be sick. It's not nice to watch. There are medication that you can take, but um, yes, we have a lot of sick bags in all our pockets on the, uh, in our coveralls, that's for sure. 
Oh, but what an opportunity to experience zero, zero G. It would, be just, it would be worth the risk, definitely. Gail, did you always want to work in space? Oh, yes. I, I can't remember a time when I didn't want to. Uh, my very first memories are from looking up at the, at the night sky and thinking, I want to be there. I need to be there. H how do I get there? And since then, I've been trying very hard to get there. <laughs> and you nearly became an astronaut. How, was that, how did that selection process happen? And what were some of the requirements you needed to do? Yes, so uh, NASA typically hold astronaut selections every year. They have a lot of money, they have a lot of people, and they have a lot of resources. So if you don't get in from one year to the next, it's not such a bad thing. You can tell from my accent that I'm neither Australian nor American. I'm, Euro I'm still European. And the Europeans hold selections far less frequently. So there was one in 1996, which I wasn't old enough for. And then in 2008, they put out a call for astronauts and everyone had to be aged between 27 and 37. And I happened to be right in the middle of that age bracket at the time. So I got my chance. And 11,000 people from 17 European countries applied. And essentially they were in a lottery for six seats. So the odds were not great at all. And we went through a long sequence of tests about every six to eight months, sorry, every six to eight weeks. And over a period of about a year, we were whittled down from 11,000 to those six. And I got down to the last few hundred, uh, but didn't quite make the final cut, unfortunately. Oh, but so close, that's yes. amazing. <laughs> what do you think are some of the skills or attributes that NASA and other space organizations are looking for in future astronauts? It actually very much depends on the mission that you're applying for. So in 2008, the recruitment was for six month missions on the International Space Station. So they were looking for people who could um, work in small teams of six people in confined areas who could conduct a wide range of scientific experiments with minimal training and who essentially wouldn't argue and would be easy to get on with and would be very uh, amenable. Now, this is a very different kind of set of requirements compared to say the Apollo astronauts. These were, these were a smaller crew of three and they were going you know, far, far away on, in very difficult technology with a high risk of death. So, they were looking for different attributes. And this year, the European Space Agency is recruiting again. Thankfully, they've removed the age limit. So yes, I shall be applying again. And this time, these people are going to be recruited for Artemis missions. So it's, it's a whole different recruitment process. The Artemis missions will see the first woman set foot on the moon in 2024. She is going to be American. She won't be European. But from there, the Artemis astronauts are going to be setting all manner of records because, simply put, we've only had 12 people set foot on the moon. They were all men. They were all Americans. So basically, any new nationality that walks on the moon is going to be setting a record. And I know that ESA is keen to not only increase their female astronaut cohort. There's only one active female astronaut in the, uh, in the core of 16 at the moment. But ESA have also announced that they want to launch the first para astronauts into space. And this is particularly fascinating because essentially on a, an orbiting spacecraft, if you're not planning to walk anywhere, your legs actually aren't very useful in space. So the call has gone out to those with uh, lower limb disabilities, and it's going to be very interesting to see how that develops. It will be very interesting. What's the exciting opportunities for so many people and good luck with your application. We hope to see you in space soon. Thanks, And Gail, Karen. before we finish, can you tell us a little bit about the program that you run at, at RMIT now? The yes, so we've launched the three-year degree. It's a Bachelor of Space Science. It started last year, so we now have our first set of second years starting this year. And we've built a very industry-focused degree. 
the idea is that our graduates after just three years will be going straight into the space industry here in Australia. As Tommy was hinting at earlier, you know, you do not have to go overseas to get a job in space in Australia. We have a whole wealth of uh, careers, jobs, internships, opportunities for as short or as long as you like. And we are working very closely with companies like Sabre Astronautics to ensure that there's a steady stream of flight controllers for the new mission control center. We're working with the rocket launch providers so that we can send our engineers and technicians to South Australia, to the Northern Territory and to New South Wales. And we're looking to broaden all of our partnerships as, as much as possible. I'll be getting in touch with my mates at the European Space Agency. We're looking to put experiments on the space station and this is all going to be from Australia. There's never been a better time to be interested in space. That's the common message I'm getting from everybody. Thank you so much, Gail. And if I can ask our other panelists to come back and join us, I've got a couple of quick questions to run through. This is a bit of a section that I call fact or fiction. So there's a lot of perceptions about who can work in space and what the jobs are. So I wanna ask, go around each of you and ask you a question and tell me if it's uh, fact or fiction and feel free to expand if you want to. So Tommy, actually, uh, let me see, which is the best one? Okay, Tommy, I'll ask you this one. Do you need to be really brainy to work in space? Like for example, if you haven't got two, two PhDs, you won't get in? Well, I have zero PhDs and I'm managed to be here. So definitely false. That fiction. one is fiction. Okay, no <laughs> problem. Um, Gail, do you have to be really good at maths to be an astronaut? False. False, yep, just like that. <laughs> that is a common perception about the prerequisite for working in space. So I'm glad you've, um, you've cleared that up for us. Yeah, and for every one person who goes into space, for every astronaut, there are 3,000 people on Earth who put them there. That's and okay. one of them is most definitely going to be your astrophysicist and they are the ones you want to do your qualification, your calculations for you. Definitely. So not everybody has to have that skill. No. Brilliant. Um, Annie, do you think you have to have perfect eyesight to be an astronaut? Um, actually, I think you do need to meet minimum requirements because obviously you're doing a lot of activities. But the one thing that I can say is, just like Gail was saying, is that we are looking at being a bit more... Um, diverse in the types of people we attract and um, retain. But just like in the Defence Force, just like with pilots, you do need to meet minimum requirements. So that one is somewhat true, but there's definitely room for diversity within that. I should point out that I'm not somebody that deals with astronauts because Australia does not have an astronaut program. But we do know that we, we do want to attract different types of people. Definitely. And Helen, do you think you need to be as fit as an Olympic athlete to be an astronaut or to work in space? Um, I don't think so. I think it takes all sorts of people and and definitely people with different backgrounds. Gail, um, I remember asking this question to Gail that I, you know, do I have to be uber fit? And she sort of pretty much dispensing me of that notion. And it is really encouraging to see Issa um, looking um, to people who would, would, would class themselves as with a disability because it's not a disability in space to, to not be able to walk. And so it, it's fascinating that it's becoming much more of an in inclusive space um, for everybody. It's fascinating and it's exciting and it's been a pleasure to talk to you all today. Thank you so much for joining us in this Careers with STEM Space webinar. I've learned so much and I hope that our attendees have learned more as well. We'll be sharing this as a video via the Careers with STEM YouTube playlist so you can share it with your friends, with your students, with your family, anyone that you know that has an interest in working in space will be able to find out there, there are so many opportunities um, available at the moment and there's never been a better time to explore these opportunities. So it brings us to the end of our Careers with STEM webinar. Thank you so much panelists for joining us and we look forward to hearing your stories. That brings us to the end of this Careers with STEM space webinar. Thank you for joining us live or viewing this later. If you want to find out more about space careers, head to our website, careerswithstem.com and check out the e-edition of the magazine or navigate to our space articles and people. Thank you to our amazing panelists and to the editorial team at Careers with STEM who made this possible. 
We hope you can join us at the next Careers with STEM webinar. Make sure you follow us on our socials and our e-newsletter to find out more. Goodbye.